Okay, guys, I had to break this into two parts. Not that I wanted to, but I had a technical difficulty. My microphone and my headphone became unplugged from the computer, and I have no I, I had no idea when it did, so I had to stop and check and see where I needed to pick up from. Okay, the electoral connection hinges on incumbency. This was aimed at the House of Representatives. These are elected, these House members are elected from or by, by they represent districts. There's a court case out there, Supreme Court case called Reynolds versus Sims, has a lot to do with how we draw our districts, has everything to do with it. Reynolds versus Sims, the idea is one person, one vote. Each person's vote should have approximately the same power as somebody else's vote. Well, one equals one, right? Not necessarily. Remember, we're talking about the House of Representatives. How many members, how many voting members are there? 435 voting members. Each member represents a district. For the House to pass a bill, they have to receive a majority vote, 218 votes. It is by district. Okay. Now, let's, let's do some math. Let's have some fun. And I'm going to create three districts, districts one, two, and three. And each district has 10 people. And I ask a very, very important question. Now, this is what we're voting on today. What do we want for lunch? Nachos or hamburgers? District one says nachos. District two says hamburgers. District three says, ah, uh, we want hamburgers today. What are we having for lunch? Hamburgers. Why? Two out of three districts, two out of the th out of the three districts voted for hamburgers. Fair enough. I'm going to redraw districts. Why? Because I can and because I want to. District 1 has three people. District 2 has three people. District 3 has 24 people. What are we having for lunch today? Hamburgers or nachos? District 1, all three people unanimously vote nachos. District 2, all three people unanimously vote nachos. Six for nachos, zero for hamburgers. District three unanimously vote hamburgers. So six votes for nachos, 24 for hamburgers. What are we having for lunch? We're still having nachos. Why? Remember, it's not individual votes, it's district votes. District 1 and 2 said nachos, District 3 said hamburgers. So two districts to one, nachos to hamburgers. Well, what if it, what about the fact that there's only six people in those two districts and they overrode the will of 24? Well, sucks to be one of the 24, doesn't it? So does, does one always equal one? No. Reynolds v. Sims was put into place to avoid that situation. It was to make it was put into place so that every person would have approximately the same power, the same political power as the, the person in the other districts. Well, how do we know how many people go in each district? Reynolds v. Sims each district was, must have the same number of people. Well, how do we know how many people that is? Every 10 years, years that end in zero, the U.S. government performs what? The U.S. Census. The job of the U.S. Census is to try to count every person in the United States. 
numerous reasons why, but this is the big one for representation. Why is this so important for us? Why do we need to participate in the census every 10 years? Well, if our state gains population, what does that mean for us in regards to power in the House of Representatives? Remember, membership there, the number of, of House seats, is based on population. So if our state gets bigger, it gains in population, we get more seats. That means that other states, if we gain seats, other states have to lose seats. There's only a total of 435. So Reynolds v. Sims, census every 10 years to count the people so we know how many people are put into districts. Something else, let's talk about districts and what else we see done with them to help protect political power, to help protect the incumbency. In most states, state legislatures will draw districts. If you take Texas, we have 36 U.S. Mem House members that might go up. This is before the 2020 census. So let's just say for right now, we have 36 House districts. That's better. How can we just don't divide the state into 36 little squares to represent or have one member from each district? Well, it's easy. There's actually two reasons. First off, Texas is not a square state, so it is physically impossible to draw Texas into 36 squares. The second, simply, remember, this is still based on population. We, we don't have the population spread out evenly, so we have to draw these fun, clunky little districts. When we draw these districts in Texas, the U.S. House, excuse me, well, yeah, the U.S. House is, these House districts are drawn by the Texas legislature. The legislature will gerrymander these districts. Gerrymander, they're going to draw these districts for various purposes, various reasons. When they gerrymander districts, there are four reasons that they can gerrymander. Some are legal, two are legal, one is illegal, one is a maybe. Depends on something. So let's look at the four reasons you can gerrymander. The first reason, elect, uh, to protect political power, to protect or, or promote political power. Can the state legislature draw districts with the intent of these districts electing a member from a certain political party? Yes, that is perfectly legal. The Supreme Court has ruled this is a reason that the, the state legislature can draw the district how they draw it. Second reason to gerrymander, to diffuse, to reduce minority voting power. Can the state draw districts with the intent of having less minorities elected to office? The answer, no. They cannot, they cannot gerrymander with the intention of reducing of preventing minorities from getting elected. The third tactic, the third reason, these are all tactics, or the should have called them tactics, these are all tactics to gerrymandering. The third tactic is creating something called a majority minority district. A majority minority district is 
the majority of people in this district are of a certain racial or ethnic minority. So say we're drawing five districts. And remember, we talked about sociological representation. What if we intentionally drew these districts to put a slight majority Anglo in each district? Based on the idea of sociological representation, we may put 52% in District A, 52% in District B, 51.7% in District C, 53.1 in District D, 52.8 in District D. E. Based on sociological representation, if we are going to vote because they match our gender, all five districts will elect an Anglo person. Minorities do not have an opportunity. Well, if we create that majority minority district, in District D, we create 70, a district that's 75% Hispanic. In District E, we, we create a district that's 75% African American. Is this legal? Can we create this majority minority district? The court has recognized the creation of majority minority districts, but the true answer is going to be, is it legal? How well can you lie? What do I mean by that? Whenever you draw a new district, you're going to get sued. Somebody in the state's going to sue you. They're going to say you're trying to defuse minority voting power. Now, in this situation, A, B, and C, slight majority Anglo, D and E, uh, majority minority district has to help Hispanics to help African Americans. What is the argument? How is this, how can you make this racial? Well, you can say, yes, minorities can win district D and E, but they don't have a realistic shot at A, B, and C. Remember, this is based on sociological representation. So realistically, you're not letting minorities have a chance to win 100%. How do you fix that? What is your defense? You say, well, yes, I intentionally created a majority minority district for Hispanics. I intentionally created a majority minority district for African Americans. I was not trying to diffuse or I was not trying to reduce minority voting power. I was actually trying to ensure that a minority gets elected. I was trying to diversify Congress. Because even if I put a small majority, if I put 53% in at African American, 53% at a Hispanic, there's no guarantee that those districts would elect somebody from their racial or ethnic background. By creating this minority or this majority minority district, by putting such a big percent of one minority in a district, I'm attempting to make sure that a minority gets elected. Is it true? Maybe. If the court buys it, well, then they'll say okay. If they don't, well, you better go back to the drawing board and try again. The last one is something called, the last tactic is called the pairing technique, P-A-I-R-I-N-G. And the pairing technique, to represent your district, you must live in your district. So what we're going to do, we're the state legislature, we're, we're the Texas state legislature, and we look over the great state of Texas, and we see District 1 and District 2, 
And we really, really dislike the elected officials from District 1 and District 2. Why? Well, because the Texans legislature is controlled by Republicans, and these elected officials belong to the Democratic Party. So what we do, it's we're going to redistrict. Imagine if we have 20 people. I'm going to show you, I have, I'm going to post a video that does a better job of this actually illustrating it. But if we have four rows, five people in each row, left or right. So that's 20 people. The first person, bottom left, first person in the bottom row represents District 1. District 1 is those two, those two lines running left to right, 10 people. The top two lines are District 2. The top left-hand corner person represents District 2. I look at these districts and I don't like them because I can't beat them. Their district is Democrats, and I know this. But it's going to change. I'm going to try something different. When it comes time to redistrict, I still have these 20 people, but instead of running these districts from left to right, from west to east, I'm running them up and down, north and south. Now, if you're looking at these districts, the two, the two lines, still 10 people, but the two lines on the left-hand side are District 1. The two lines on the right-hand side are District 2. I have put the incumbent from District 1 in with the incumbent from District 2. They have to run against each other. Why is this a big deal? To represent a district, you must live in your district. So for one of them to continue representing, to continue to hold office, they must defeat the other one. So I now have an incumbent from District 1, but I don't have an incumbent from District 2. District 1, Democrat runs against Democrat, a Democrat wins. Big deal. District 1 started off with a Democrat. District 2, 1 ends up with a Democrat. Ah, but District 2, I now have a Democrat running against a Republican. If the Democrat wins, is it a big deal? No, it's not a big deal. It started, I started off with two Democrats. I ended up with two Democrats. But if a Republican wins, I started off with two Democrats and I ended up with a Democrat and a Republican. I increased my party power. Is the pairing technique legal? Yes. Okay. These are the four tactics to gerrymandering. We, they, we see that gerrymandering helps people stay incumbents. We see gerrymandering helps people get reelected election after election. Remember, we do not have term limits. You can serve as many terms as you want. There's always a question of should we? Should we have term limits? And that, that's a hard question. Some people say, well, you know, we shouldn't because we are electing those we think are best represent, best represent us. They have the working knowledge, they have the education, they have the experience. Those are people who don't run and they say we should have term limits because this incumbency, this encourages people not to run for office. If you're going to run for office, you're going to take this chance. You're going to expose yourself to the world. All your secrets are going to be found out. They're going to look through your background, background with a fine tooth comb. And chances are really good. You're going to lose. Do you want to expose all of your secrets to the world on the, on the small chance that you are going to win? Probably not. So should we have term limits? There's arguments for it. There's arguments against it. 
in reality, I will say Congress needs term limits. They need these term limits because for a bill to pass Congress, it must pass both the House and the Senate. They need each other. So House members need senators that they know they trust, that they know are going to be there the next term. Same thing for senators. They need House members that they've worked with, that they've built relationship with, that they know are going to win re-election, and that four years down the road, they're going to be there. So Congress actually does need incumbency. Whether it's good or bad, that is totally your opinion. Direct patronage. This helps get you reelected. Direct patronage means bringing home the bacon. Congress members often have the opportunity to provide direct benefits, this is patronage, for their constituents. That is, they provide projects for their districts which bring in money. When they do this, this is often called pork barrel or pork barrel spending, it's called pork. The ability to bring home pork to a district increases the chances of re-election. Now, how does the government get most of their money? From us, in the form of taxes. Does the government use all of, their, use all of our money? No, honestly, they don't. They, act, they actually have extra money they could use if they chose. Well, when they have this extra money, do they return it to us, the taxpayers? No, they don't. They keep it. They spend it on stuff they don't need to. But we want our money back. If we're not going to get our money back, we at least want to benefit from our money. So our elected officials, our House members, our senators, they're going to try to get bills passed that are going to be, that have this pork in them, this pork barrel spending. They're going to try and get bills passed that's going to bring money back to our district or money back to our state. Why are they going to try and do this? This is just so that our elected official, they can, our congressperson can point to all of the acts they performed while they were in Congress, show that they brought home money to their district, brought home money to their state, and this is proof that they are working for their constituents. We have seen a decrease in pork barrel spending. Of, well, a few years ago, both parties, Republican and Democrat, agreed that they would not be in any more pork barrel spending, but we are seeing that that is, Congress recently has gotten away from that. What I mean by this, okay. A few years ago, we had a hurricane hit the East Coast. It hit New Jersey. This hurricane was called Super Storm Sandy, and it really, really messed up New Jersey. So Senate is debating a, a relief bill they want to send money to the state of New Jersey to help them. And the bill of this, the total amount of this grows to about $52 billion. This bill does not pass. Why not? Because what we start to see is pork. We see only about $26 billion of it is going to New Jersey. The other half of it is going to various states for various other projects that had nothing to do with the original intent of this bill. I mean, the one that stuck out for me then was part of this $52 billion, and it's a small amount in total, but just the idea. So we had about $110,000 going to a small government building in, I believe it was North Dakota, to pay for new stained glass windows. What does that have to do with the original intent of the bill? Not a thing. That is called pork barrel spending. Why do they want pork? Why do our Congress people want pork? Remember, if it's going to pass each chamber, it has to pass by a majority vote. 
So in the House, you need 218 votes. In the Senate, you need 51. So once again, House. I represent a district in Texas, and I want to bring $2 billion to my district to build a skate park for my district. I write a bill, and the only thing on this bill, $2 billion for a skate park. I have to get 217 additional yes votes for this out of the House to pass my bill. Am I going to get an additional 217 votes? No. Why not? Because it doesn't benefit anybody else in their district. There is no reason for them to do this. But I know this, and I'm going to be smart. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for a transportation bill. I'm going to wait for a national defense bill. National defense, we need $250 billion to fund our Department of Defense for the next year. When this bill comes up for a vote, I am going to amend, I'm going to, this bill, I'm going to tack on my little $2 billion for the skate park in my district to this big defense bill. Why? If I do this, do you think it's going to pass? Yes, the defense bill is going to pass. The defense bill has gone from $500 billion to $502 billion. But why is it going to pass? Why am I going to get those other 217 votes? If my equals, if my co-workers in the House don't vote for it, when they run for re-election, whoever they're running against is going to say, your elected official, your House member did not vote to fund the Defense Department. So I'm going to add this pork to this original bill. My, I'm going to add what I want to the original bill so I get what I want because I know it will pass. doesn't have anything to do with the original bill. Do you think I am the only one doing that or are other House members going to do it? Other House members do it. So suddenly we go from a bill that was $500 billion for defense spending to a bill that $700 billion and this $200 billion is things that are totally non-defense related. Pork or pork barrel spending. The organization of Congress is shaped by party. To exercise its power to make the law, Congress must first organize. The building blocks of congressional organization include the political parties, committee systems, congressional staff, the caucuses or meetings, the meetings of each party, and the parliamentary rules of the House and the Senate. Each part plays a role in congressional organization and legislative formulation. I'm only going to talk about a bit of it right now. Plain English. Party leadership in the House and in the Senate organizes powers. Understand, we have two parties, two major parties, Republican and Democrat. Which party controls the majority of seats in which chamber determines the leadership. Let's, no, I still don't want to do there. Let's start off with the House because it's the easiest. In the House, the most powerful position in the House is a position called Speaker of the House. They represent, they are a member of the House. They are one of the 435 House members, but they set the agenda for the House. They help decide what bills, when, when a bill is filed in the House, the House, the Speaker of the House gets to assign it to a committee. So they, uh, they decide what committees these bills are assigned to. 
they and other leadership positions from the party decide mem- committee membership. They get to recognize speakers when it comes down to debate. These leadership positions, these two, the the major leader, leadership positions in the House and the major leadership in the position are very, very powerful. They're very, very important. In the House, the top position, the top dog is called Speaker of the House. Okay. We say it's elected from all 435 members. Yes, technically that's true. However, is that really true? In the House, in the Senate, we have the majority party. We have the minority party. The majority party is simply the party that has the most seats in that in that chamber. So are we going to elect the Speaker of the House from the minority party? Why? No, we're not. Why? Well, the answer is simply, would, do you agree that Democrats and Republicans have different ideas of what government should do, how, how it should be run, who it's supposed to help? Yes. If the Democrats have the majority of seats in the House, are they going to put the power, are they going to give the majority power, are they going to give the most powerful position to the opposite party? No, they're not, because then the Democrats won't do what they want. So, yeah, the Speaker of the House is technically elected from the entire House population, all of the House members, but realistically, it's from the majority party. Underneath the Speaker of the House, we have two additional positions. We have the House Majority Leader. They're going to lead the majority party. We have the House Minority Leader. They're going to be the face of the minority party. The Speaker of the House is going to go on TV, and they're going to explain the position that the majority party took, and they're going to explain why. The House Minority Leader is going to go on TV and explain why the House, the Speaker of the House, why the majority party is wrong. So we know who the House or the Speaker of the House is. We know who the House Minority Leader is. We have the House Majority Leader. Who is that? I have a better question. Do we care? Honestly, the answer is no, we don't care. Why not? House Majority Leader from the Majority Party. Speaker of the House elected basically from the Majority Party. Speaker of the House, the most powerful position out there. So the House Majority Leader is not going to get any airtime. They're not going to be asked for any explanations. It's going to go all to the Speaker of the House. So that's the House Majority. In the Senate, we have this position called President Pro Tempore. Sounds great. Sounds important. Technically, they're in charge. Realistically, they're not. The President Pro Tempore is a ceremonial position. It belongs to the oldest member of the majority party. It has a little bit of importance that, and I mean very, very little, but I'll talk about that when we discuss the executive branch. Senate leadership. Once again, we have two parties, majority party, minority party. We have the Senate majority leader, the Senate minority leader. The Senate majority leader, top dog. They get to help put people from their party on committees. They get to help decide committee leadership. If a bill is filed in the Senate, they get to assign it to a committee. The Senate Majority Leader, it is at their whim 
that bills are taken off the Senate calendar and discussed and voted on. If they don't want a bill to come up for discussion for a vote, they don't bring it off the calendar. They have total control over what bill we're voting on. I'll give you an example of why that's a big, big power trip, big power thing in a few minutes. But leaders of the Senate, the Senate Majority Leader, Senate Minority Leader. I mentioned committee system. Real, real quick. The committee system is central to congressional operations. Congress relies on committees to do the work to build legislation. We see there are four types of committees. The first, standing committees. Standing committees are permanent in nature. Every Congress, every congressional session, the same standing committee will exist. These committees have the power to propose and write legislation. The jurisdiction, the area of authority of each committee, covers a particular subject matter. Could be finance, tax, trade, social security, Medicare. Among the most important standing committees are those in charge of finances, such as taxation, such as trade. Appropriations committees also play an important role. Appropriations is just the legal term for funding. Appropriations is the legal term for the government transferring money to the agencies or whoever they're giving it to. So appropriations committees play important roles because they decide how much funding various programs will actually receive. There's another standing committee in the House, and the House only, it's called the House Rules Committee. The House Rules Committee allots debate time and floor amendment rules. Once again, we'll talk about that in just a second. Select committees. Select committees are usually temporary legislative committees set up to highlight or investigate or address a particular issue not within the jurisdiction of existing committees. Joint committees. These are committees formed by members of both chambers of Congress, so both the House and the legislature. There are four of these committees. These are economic, taxation, library, and printing. The last one, conference committees. These are temporary joint committees created to work out a compromise on the House and Senate versions of a piece of legislation. These committees are important to, to reconcile differences between the House and Senate legislation. So conference committees. So if we're going to look at these, we can say our committees can be divided up based on three things. The first thing is length. Are they a permanent committee or are they temporary? Permanent, they exist every legislative session. Temporary, they exist for a short time. Second thing we're going to look at, their job. These standing committees. They can propose legislation. All these other committees, they, they're going to do things, especially the select committees, the conference committees. They're created to handle one particular issue, to investigate one particular item. These select committees, these conference committees, they have authority. They are created if no other committee has jurisdiction. Finally, the last, so the longevity, the job, last is membership. Is it inclusive or is it exclusive? Inclusive means that members from both chambers are on this committee. Exclusive means that it is only, members only belong to one chamber. So we can look at these three things, 
longevity, job, and membership to help us determine what type of committee we are dealing with. How a bill becomes a law. The rules for congressional procedures are important to the legislative process. These rules govern the process from the introduction of a bill. This is when a proposed law is sponsored by a congressional member and submitted to the clerk of the House or the Senate. And it goes all the way up to the president for a signature. So let's talk about what happens. A bill becomes a law. I'm going to start off with the House just because the House has an extra step. So a bill is created. A, a bill is written by a House member. It's filed with the, what did I call it, the clerk of the House. It then is sent to the Speaker of the House. They send it to a committee for committee deliberation. So the committee, they're going to work on this bill, maybe. The committee they can hold hearings, testimony. It can mark up. It can revise. It can amend this bill. Call witnesses for the bill. Call witnesses against the bill. Actually, does the committee have to work on a bill? No, no, they don't have to work on it at all. And in fact, most bills these committees don't even work on. They are left to die in committee. But you get lucky and they work on your bill. The committee does their work. Then they vote on it. Much like the House, it's going to be a majority vote. If the majority members of the committee vote to advance it, to the full house. It will leave the that particular committee in the house, in the house only. It goes to that rules committee that I talked about earlier. Did I call it the house rules Com committee or the calendar committee? It's the same thing, the house rules committee or the house calendar committee. Once it goes to the rules committee, the committee has their job. They will select a date that the House will debate this bill. So once they select the date, they get to allot debate time. They get to assign debate time. 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, however much. Once this time is up, discussion, debate is over, let's vote. The other thing that the Rules Committee gets to do is they get to decide if this is going to be an open rule or a closed rule bill. Open rule means that when it comes to the House floor for debate, House members can add amendments. Closed rule means that they can't. So the, the main committee votes on it. They pass it. It then goes to the, the House Rules Committee. They do their job. They set these three things. It is then going to be placed on the calendar where when that day comes, the House members following these rules are going to discuss it. Once time is up, they're going to vote yes or no. Now, I started off with the House because I said there's that extra step. The House has the House Rules Committee. The Senate doesn't. Debate is less restricted in the Senate than in the House. It starts off with the same process. A bill is written by a senator, filed with the clerk of the Senate. It's sent to the Senate Majority Leader, who sends it to a committee. They work on it. They amend it, mark it up, call witnesses, testify. When they're done with their work, they will vote on this Senate bill. Once it goes, once it passes them, it goes back to the Senate calendar where 
when or if if the the Senate Majority Leader decides that he wants to vote on it, he or she, they can take it off the calendar. Are they required to? No, they're not. They can sit on the calendar and or it can sit in their office and die. They don't have to do anything with it. They don't have to call it up. But the Senate Majority Leader calls it up for a vote and we start discussing it. How long can we discuss this bill? We have something out there, the Senate has something called a filibuster. Basically, the filibuster, you're going to try and talk this bill to death. Remember, they, were, they encouraged debate, deliberation, because they have six years where the House doesn't. The House has this House Rules Committee. We have two hours to debate this, whatever. Senate, man, we can spend weeks talking about this. Person can get up and filibuster. We may have one senator get up, say this is a horrible bill, don't vote for it, and proceeds to read the stand to us. They get done reading the stand. It's about 1,200 pages. They're tired. Their, their throat hurts. So they pass off to a sympathetic senator who gets up and, for some reason, reads The Eye of the Dragon to us. Horrible book. So they read The Eye of the Dragon. It's about 800 pages. They get done. They pass off to a sympathetic senator who reads, what else do they read? They read The Tommy Knockers to us. Okay, what should you know about me by now? You should know that I like Stephen King. Those are all Stephen King books. If you've never read them, you need to read more. Go read Stephen King. Is this legal? Can we do this? Yes, we can. This is a filibuster. We're going to try to talk the bill to death. The point of this is we're going to try and filibuster this bill with the hopes that the author of the bill will eventually pull the bill from consideration, come up and say, okay, what do you not like? What do I need to change on this so that you will allow it to go through? But that's the filibuster. Before a bill can go to the president's desk, that must be approved by each chamber, the Senate, the House, and each chamber, each bill, each version of the bill must match exactly. What are the odds that the House bill is going to match the Senate bill? Very, very little. So now we come to this conference committee that I mentioned a minute ago. Standing committees and conference committees are the important ones. Conference committees, we're going to take members from the House and we're going to take members from the Senate, and their whole purpose is to negotiate, is to compromise on these bills. The Senate might say, I have to have A, B, and C. I would like to have D, E, and F. The House says, we can let you have A and B, but you can't have C. We have to have D and E. F is a we don't care about F either way. So this conference committee, they're going to try and negotiate, hammer out a compromise. Do they have to agree? No, actually, they don't have to agree here. A bill can make it through both chambers, can pass both chambers, but it can still die in conference committee. But you're lucky. Your bill passes both chambers. It goes to conference committee, and they hammer out an agreement. Well, then it started in the House. It, so it's going to go back to the House. The House is going to vote on it where we expect it to pass because it's already been in the conference committee, already had an agreement. It then goes to the Senate where the Senate's going to vote on it. And we expect it to pass because it's already been compromised on the same copy of the bill as both chambers. So now it's going to go to the desk of the president. Congratulations, we've cleared the first hurdle. We see that the president can control the flow of legislation. 
the bill is sent to the president where one of three things can happen. The first, the president signs the bill and it becomes a law. There is much rejoicing in the street because Congress and the president worked together and we actually got something accomplished. The second thing which can happen, the president can veto a bill. Remember I mentioned the veto in checks and balances. He can tell the legislature no. The president has 10 days, not including Sundays, to decide whether or not he, is going to, he or she is going to sign the bill. If the president does not sign the bill within 10 days, it becomes law. If he vetoes the bill, he returns it to Congress. Congress has the opportunity to, to override the veto. However, there's a catch here to the, with this 10 days in Congress and the override veto. If Congress passes a bill and gives it to the president with less than 10 days left in the legislative session, we can see something occur called the pocket veto. The president vetoes the bill after Congress has adjourned. He goes to return it to Congress, but nobody's there to accept the veto. So he slides it under the doors to Congress and he goes back to the White House when Congress returns from their break, they see the vetoed bill, can they attempt to override the veto? No, they can't. They have to start all over. This is the pocket veto. Congress adjourned. They do not have the opportunity to override the veto. What influences Congress? How does Congress make their decisions? There are several internal and external factors which help Congress people decide what they're going to do. Let's talk about external, outside the congressional body. First is constituents, you and me. Constituents do matter to how a congressperson votes because Congress, our people, realize that voting on what the constituents what, want is what gets them reelected to Congress. However, most constituents do not know what policies or con congresspersons support or even how they vote. We don't pay attention because we don't care about most things. If we don't care, this opens up another external influence interest groups, special interest, political action committees, lobbyists. They will come up to our, our ele elected officials and say, support us, vote for what we want. It won't hurt you. Your constituents back home don't care. Vote for us. We will donate to your campaign. So this is another external. Internal. Party leaders, party discipline. Party leaders, the Speaker of the House, the House Majority Leader, the House Minority Leader, and the Senate, the Senate Majority Leader, the Senate Minority Leader, they set the bar. They set the expectation of how their party members are going to vote. If they're going to vote to support a bill, if they're going to vote to be against a bill. If the lay people, if, if the non-leadership people vote against or go against the party line, party leaders can punish them. They can assign their bills if they sponsor a bill, if they create a bill. Remember, it goes to the clerk of that chamber. It then goes to the, the presiding. That's the term. I, I haven't used it yet the presiding officer of that chamber, the presiding officer of the House is the Speaker, the presiding officer of the Senate is the, the Senate Majority Leader. 
your bill goes to the presiding officer. They assign it to a committee. They don't like you. You didn't support them. You didn't vote the way they wanted you to vote. Do they have to send your bill to the proper committee? No, they don't. They can punish you this way. If you can't send a bill to the proper committee that's going to help your district, this bill isn't going to pass. They may decide, decide to put you on a committee that has nothing to do with your district. They may decide to strip you if you were a committee chair. They may decide to take that away from you. They, mo they may donate money to your opponent in a primary election. They may come say, you need to vote for this other Republican or this other Democrat running against you. There are various ways that party leaders can enforce party discipline for those who don't do what they want. Other task, understand for Congress, their main job is lawmaking, writing these bills. This is most of what they do. However, there are other tasks that they are given. They oversee how legislation is implemented. This is called oversight. Congress passes a bill. It goes to the executive branch. The president signs it into law. It is up to the agencies that are headed by the executive branch to put these policies into place to implement them. They may not implement them the way Congress meant. We'll talk about that later this semester. Congress and their oversight, they can subpoena committee or agency heads, say, come testify in front of us. Tell us how this is working. So Congress can make sure the bill is doing what it was intended. The Senate has the advice and consent power. There are a number of positions in the federal government that the president gets to appoint people to. Ambassadorships, the U.S. Supreme Court, his cabinet, his or her cabinet, excuse me. However, the president gets to a point, but the Senate, using their advice and consent power, has to confirm. This is going to go back to those checks and balances or separation of powers. The president appoints, the Senate confirms. If they say, yes, this person is qualified, this is separation of powers. They are telling the president, yes, we agree with your choice. But what if they say no? What if they, they disagree? They say, we don't think this person is the best person there. Well, then that person, that nomination is out. The president has to choose somebody else that the Senate has to confirm. The last task is impeachment. This is removing elected officials from office. We can impeach the judicial branch we can impeach the judicial, the executive branch, we can impeach the judicial branch. Each chamber of Congress has its own role to play. The House, they act as a fact-finding department. They act as a grand jury. They're going to investigate the allegations, gather evidence. If they believe that the president has done something illegal, something that goes against, you know, he commits a high crime or misdemeanor. They impeach the president and it goes to the Senate for a trial. The Senate, their job, they hold the trial. They're going to decide is the president guilty of committing these crimes or not. If they decide the president is guilty, the article or the impeachment charge is true, the president or the judge and the judiciary is removed from office. They find him not guilty. Things continue as is. Last thing I have here, just for your information, the formal qualifications, we're going to find these in Article 1, the formal qualifications to run for House membership or to run for a Senate. House, got to be 25 have to be a citizen of the U.S. for seven years, 
live in the state you're elected from, serve a two-year term. Senate, age 30, citizen for nine years, live in the state you're elected from, and you serve a six-year term. Just so you know.